Um, well, without further ado, I don't think you need any introductions, but we will do. Um, Dan, and I'll start with you just as a, a very brief overview. You can give people a bit more content afterwards. Current headmaster of Sedba School, uh, former director of rugby, former chemistry, head of chemistry or chemistry teacher. Yep. Um, a Wharfdale man, scrum half. Was it Oxford or Cambridge? Cambridge. Cambridge. Um, and you had, how many years were you involved with SSFC? Uh, I, I coached for 18. I was in charge of rugby. I was director of rugby for 11. What years were they down? 2000, was it so, 2000 you yeah. started? 2000 to 2011, yeah. Uh -huh. And you played scrum half, was your playing position back in the day? Uh, mostly nine. Uh, I was fairly average 10 that couldn't kick, and I played a little bit in the centres. I, we can talk a bit later on. I don't know how you passed off your left hand if you're playing at fly half. Well, yeah, slightly, well, fairly badly. But uh, I, I had an unusual technique to pass off my left hand. This is stuff. Thanks, Dan. We'll come back to you in a minute, Danny. You can give everyone a bit more of a, an intro to your time with SSFC. Stu, when did you arrive at Sedba just after I left as a pupil, I think? Was it 2005? 2004. 2004. Yeah. And you're currently director of sport, house master of Sedgwick House, and first 15 coach, forwards coach with, with Noxy. How many years have you done this? You've done 2004 till now. No. Uh, so yeah, coaching. Yeah, uh, I did the uh, in the first year. Did uh, under 16 Bs, A2 as we call them for the first year. Then went on tour, came back, uh, coached the first team. Uh, with Dan until 20, uh, 2010 and then with, uh, then with Simon. I'm sure we'll touch on that later on. We've always talked as a group, like you guys have, and I've loved listening into it about sort of earning the SSFC stripes and where you start in your coaching sort of regime. And, you know, we get stuck in with every different age group and it's, it's good to see. So we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that later on. And then the man of the moment, Simon Mulholland, a.k.a. Noxie, a current director of rugby, Attached to Evans House and head of boys sports, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Knox, how many years have you done now? Uh, so first started in 2011. Uh, well, actually, yeah, I had a bit of time pre-Island um, as, a, as a coach coming in, uh, sort of 2006, 2007. Then came back 2011 um, and then took over as director of rugby from 2013. Oh, good stuff. We're going to get stuck into it and we'll all join in some good conversation as we go. But I think let's just start at the real, some really happy times and sort of the highs of, of the last 20 years. And Danny, if we start with you in terms of what's been the sort of highlight of, of your time? I mean, you, you're still actively involved with SSFC as a club and a community, but as your time as director of rugby, head of rugby, what was the standout moment for you? Uh, difficult to pick, Jace. The... Um... There's probably four standout 15 aside matches, which I won't go into in detail, but um, you remember Landovery 2000, uh, 2003, that you were captain of that side against Alan Wynne Jones. That was the first time the first team had gone unbeaten for 21 years since Carling's era. Uh, that was a, me a memorable match, a huge crowd on Busk. Um, Southland Boys High on tour in 2005 against some future All Blacks. Uh, incredible game for rugby. Millfield 2009, uh, a Millfield team that contained six future internationals that we picked by a point. And probably Wellington um, 2010 at Welford Road. Uh, four matches that stood out, although probably I often felt, and Knox has gone on to, to sort of solving this problem, something I, I couldn't really do. I often felt we probably overachieved at in the 15 aside game but in my time, perhaps didn't do quite as well in the seven-a-side game. Um, so to win it, to win Rosslyn Park in 2008 was a very special moment. Yeah, who, who was involved in that year, Dan, 2008? Yeah, I mean, that was, that was Tom Casson was captain, but he, he got injured on the first day. Um, Ollie Peters was the vice captain, actually captain of the sevens team. Um, he got injured in the first game. We were really down to, the, to uh, a very small squad and we had a fantastic defence and just lots of spirit. And yeah, perhaps I was going to ask you about that. Did you ever think going into that, you fancy your chances, this could be no, it? No, not at all. It was, and with respect to the boys, it, I went down thinking, you know, we'd, we'd do well to get out of the first day. They just showed fantastic spirit. And it shows what it's all about, really. You've just got to dig in, and, and those boys did. 
uh, a lot of it's about defence as well. I'm sure Noxie will back this up. If you can defend on a sevens pitch, you've got a chance. And those boys were the best defensive seven I've ever seen. Yeah, that's 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 important because you've got a lot of space to cover and uh, you're exposed. Not something I uh, I liked as a player. <laughs> Um, Stu, just going over to you, have you got any sort of standout favourite moments of your time? Yeah, I mean, I was just trying to think there, as you were saying, you know, the, the big fixtures, you know, the, the Millfields, uh, the Wellingtons, uh, Whitgifts, they're, they're always, you know, fantastic highlights because, uh, you know, they're so competitive and it's the north-south thing uh, and we're always competing for, for the top for the top slot or for the top three places uh, in recent years. Um, but a, a real standout game was um, was in 2015, actually, against Wellington. Uh, we actually played, uh, we played 12 games in a row, won all 12. We're actually in the Cup, uh, the Champions Cup that year. Um, and just for, for a combination, it was like a perfect storm within a week. In eight days, we lost to Bedford, Kirkham and Warwick. And we, you know, not make it, just certainly not making excuses. We had stacks of injuries, the back row had been injured, the standoff had got injured. We were in absolute pieces and, and Wellington were number one in the country by a mile. And we went down to, to meet them in Coventry um, and we were just staring down the barrel. And I remember the team talk, we were saying, listen, guys, just go, you've got nothing to lose. And we talked about defence all week and... Uh, yeah, we were huge underdogs, and uh, we, we we clinched it in the last in the last few minutes. Bonham scored. Um, it was a fantastic, fantastic result. Because otherwise, we're still staring down the barrel. We could have easily gone on and lost six in a row. Because we, we then played Wellington, Landover, and Millfield. It could have it could have been a disastrous uh, six game losing streak. But the, the lads are you know so tenacious, so so tough. That was a brilliant, brilliant result that day under you know really tough conditions. Yeah, these are our favourite moments. And, you know, the best thing about the other three people on this screen other than me is that you'll be brutally honest in analysing everything over the SSFC years. But what makes um, what makes those days special? So if you talk about your Millfield, your Wellington, your Kirkham, as a school, factually, we are significantly smaller in numbers. So for us to be competing, or SSFC to be competing um, at that level, What's the what's the difference, or what's the what's the special thing about our boys, Stu? Oh, I just I, I just think we've you know you you, you peel everything back, uh, and I think it's the fact that you know we are a full boarding school, and I think we do everything together here. Uh, so regardless of how how much bigger they are uh, of us, and, uh, and over the years we have been in those big games, we've been the underdog. You know, we are we do everything together. You know, we, we live together, we, you know, we eat together, we play together, we do everything together. We're such a tight community. Um, and I think when it comes down to it, when things get really tough, uh, and things do get, you know, it gets, they learn a lot about themselves in these tough, tough games. When it gets really tough, they're not, they're not playing for, for anybody other than themselves uh, when, when they're out there on the pitch. And I think that, that, that's the difference um, when it really comes down to it. Yeah, good. Cheers, Stu. And, we could be a while here, Knox. So, over to you. You've had some incredible, mo and I've been lucky enough to actually watch and see some of yours. Um, and you know, we're all so proud of what you're achieving and what you'll continue to achieve. But what's your what's your favourite moment so far? Yeah, t tough one. Um, and I've got a few. Uh, I guess similar to, to Dan, but you know, 2013 for me was a special year. I, I probably, you know, I got my dream job, director of rugby at Super School, and. You know that first year in charge is always a, a special one, and we we uh, we had a good side, and we we played um, run beaten. We went on a tour to Abu Dhabi uh, and played Millfield away, and and, and got absolutely thrashed uh, against a, a really good Millfield side. Uh, we lost twenty six nil, um, and then was staring down the barrel of, of going to Millfield, which is obviously a very difficult place to win. And uh, we went sort of four weeks later and, and beat them by twenty five points. Um, so sort of turn the table a little bit and that, and that was a special one and, you know looking over the last few years um, the Blackrock victory this year was a, was a, a great way to finish um, in the last play I think Tom Curtis's sideline conversion against Wellington at Broad Street was was one that will be never forgotten um, you know as Stu said the 2015 victory for as and in particular the Ford pack we had that day were just undermatched undersized um, just gave their all uh, and a sort of a typical um, brave display in a brown jersey. But I, I think probably if I was to pick one, it would be 
for one sort of moment, it would be the 2017-18 group. So we had a great 15 aside season. We went unbeaten, number one in the country. We then won Roslyn Park. Uh, and then we went to the 10s. And we never really spoke about, you know, doing a treble or uh, winning every tournament we or every format of the game that we entered. And we got to the final and we had nothing left um, against a really strong Brighton side. And uh, I'll never forget the last sort of five minutes we... We had a lead and by two points and we, we just we just couldn't get the ball and we just defended and defended and sort of a minute to go we uh, we had the ball on our own line and we, we sort of picked and goed uh, for a minute to, to sort of take care of the clock and something we've talked about all year but <clears throat> never really did it and I remember Cam Redpath, Tom Curtis, um, Charlie Patworth kept sort of asking the ref how long sir, how long and 60 seconds went to 20 and 10 and I remember Cam Redpath kicking it off and you know, everyone falling to their knees and, and just sort of a really nice moment when that final whistle went, just looking around at the smiles on faces and you know, the hugs and the, almost that uh, disbelief that we'd, we'd, we'd done it. And a uh, you know, pretty special moment for, for the school and for the club. You know, no other school in history had, had done that at that point and uh, just a nice way to finish. Yeah, I think you've, you, all three of you have... have have gifted so many lads and families because there's lots of mums and dads attached to the club as well. So many special moments and it's something that'll that'll continue, I'm sure. Just going back to your first comment, Knox, 2013 dream job. Uh, I think two things really, you know, why is it, silly question, but why is it your, your dream job and, and how did you know what to expect? Did you know what to expect when you started? Yeah, I think, um, oh, look, you, you only have to um, be here a day to, to sort of, recognize how special this place is and and um you know we, we've got some great kids here and great staff and um you know it is full boarding and and you know the hours are long but you know you, you certainly um you know you get massive reward um and and what you get in with these young men you, you certainly get back and look I, I was lucky enough to um watch dan harrison coach and and um spend some time with him when i first came into the role and I remember just thinking um, and, and watching him and, and just being in awe of uh, the respect the players had for him um, and, you know, his ability to um, get the best out of those players and adapt his tactics during the game. And I just thought, look, this, this is a place where I want to be, um, you know, and, and watching those big games against Millfield and uh, Wellington, some of our big rivals, it's just uh, an outstanding program, an outstanding place to be, really. Yeah, you learn, you learn very quickly. I'll never forget my first day of school turning up and being met by Michael Rohr outside Evan's house uh, for pre-season, B1 pre-season. And I wanted to jump back in the car with mum and dad so bad. <laughs> and I think we've got Michael and, and a couple of other legends listening in tonight. I hope we have Neil McCarrow and, and Michael. And if, if you guys want to come on and share some of your favourite moments with us at, at any time, just drop a message in the, in the question box and we'll, we'll try and get you on. Dan, just, just going back to Knox's favourite moment, and, and Stu, you could jump on in this as well. So, you know, we play 15s, 7s, 10s. Um, in between the 7s and the 10s, or around the 7s and 10s, there's a Wilson run. How, how did you prepare them? So, Knox, you're amazing emotionally. So how do we prepare the guys for that journey, so for that challenge? Because it is pretty epic. Um, it's, it's a really difficult end of, end of term. And in a way, you're relying on, on quite a lot of heart here. Um, you can prepare them and you can, you can advise the runners who are not going to be in the top 20 to just go steadily around it. But the Wilson runs a huge part of what we're about at Semba. And that's got to be encouraged. So we, we, we want our rugby players to run the Wilson. It's an enormous part of what we're about. Um, but then it just comes down to spirit and actually... Getting, getting the rest when you can, sleeping all the way down to London on the coach, not doing very much, taking it easy on the first day at Roslyn Park, trying to get your key players rested enough for the second day. Um, you don't really plan for the tens. The, 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 the tens is just whatever you've got left at the end of it. Um, but it's the same for lots of schools. Um, we've, it's a very, very, very busy finish to the, to the Lent term, but a very special one. And it's a brilliant way for players to finish in their brown jersey at home, uh, in front on bus one. Stu, anything to add to that? No, I think I think uh, I think Dan's absolutely nailed it. You know, you you can talk all day about you know hydration, eating the right food, getting the sleep when you can, but ultimately, you know, it's an exhausting week. You know, we've had boys that have, uh, have 
won the Wilson, uh, come you know, top five, um, played every game down in London, come back and then played in the tens. And it is possible, but it's absolutely exhausting. And it, yeah, it, Dan's absolutely right. It, it, it's it's you know uh, the pride of playing that final game uh, for your school. You know how much heart have you got? And that's what that's what it's down to. Yeah, I think all three of you are extremely modest um, because to watch them in the sevens and the tens, and there is absolutely bags of heart and spirit. But to watch the way they execute, Dan, you talked about defence, but the way they execute mismatches, the way they um, complete uh, two-on-ones, three-on-twos, you know, there's a lot of good rugby coaching instilled and, and you know, standards that allow them to do that. Um, and, and talking about you guys as coaches on, on your coaching journeys, who were the people that inspired you to, in your coaching career? Stu, if we start with you, who, who was the one person that sort of, got you ignited around coaching well I've got a few so in the early days so my job kind of you know as a coach but I was also had to had to manage the department as a, as a, as a young man you know in 2008 I was head of boys sport and with that I had to uh, forge relationships with other coaches around the country set up things there's a lot of, that, that came outside of of actually coaching uh, and I was handed over those reins by by Chris Mann and he I learned a hell of a lot by Chris um, and, and how he managed, how he built relationships, how he did things uh, methodically and properly. So from, from outside of, of the rugby to do the management side, uh, I, le- I learned a lot from Chris Mann. But that, that, wasn't, your, that wasn't your question from, from the, the, the rugby side. You know, obviously the, these two chaps that have been in charge, I've learned so much from both Dan uh, and, and Simon over the years. But the, stu- the stuff that I do, the, you know, the tough stuff, um, I've learned a lot from, you know, a coach called Jeff Whoppet. You, you'll know him, Jason. He's coached a lot in the north. Um, you know, stuff around the set piece, the breakdown. Learned lots from him in the early days. I worked uh, closely uh, with Ian Peel. He came to to, to Sebra for uh, numerous occasions. Dan organised that uh, for him to come up. I learned a lot about the about the intricacies of the of the front row, uh, of the, the, the scrummage, and you know, and he he was absolutely fantastic for me with, with the coaching. And you know, we haven't really gone gone backwards since. He was a brilliant coach. Uh, was was Ian? Uh, so yeah, it, it, he's been he's been absolutely brilliant. Yeah, Jeff Wappet, the oracle of forward play. There's no man that knows it more than him. And yeah. then Pete, you know, he he's a European champion, Premiership champion with Saracens as a coach. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Dan, who who was there for you? Who did you work with? Look up to? Um, interesting, really. I I was very lucky to have some good coaches as I was a player. Um, lots and lots of different ones. When I first came to Sedba, um, the rugby was run by Neil Rollins, who um, had taken over from Michael Raw, and those two, uh, in completely different ways, but v- both very, very Sedbergian ways, had built the foundations which I was allowed to build on in 2000. So I was always very grateful to those two, but, and they also have stayed around and, and are very close friends, so great people to bounce things off. Um, externally, a chap I often talk to Noxie about is Rod McQueen, uh, the ACT coach, the uh, coach of Australia that went on to win absolutely everything with Australia. And his out-of-the-box thinking was uh, something that I read a lot about as a young coach and certainly changed the way I coached. Michael and Neil, to walk into the SSFC as your first time, to, you're absolutely right. And Noxie, you mentioned before, on your first day, you, you get it straight away. So to have those two... Sort of, I mean, if we were to do the last 50 years of SSFC, you know, with their knowledge, they, they've got another 30 between them. But they were <laughs> top draw for the club. Noxie, for you? Yeah, and I've been lucky enough to um, spend time with Neil and, and as well. And I mentioned Dan and how much of an influence he, he's been on me. And obviously, um, Stu's been my, my long-term assistant. And, and, and um, look, I love, I love working with him. And um, I, I think... You know, the, the main uh, person that's helped me the most, without doubt, really would be um, my brother-in-law, uh, Scott Robertson, so Razor um, at the Crusaders. And, you know, it helps with his family, and we have a very close connection. And um, look, I spoke to him a couple of days ago after they played the Hurricanes. And look, he, he's just been a huge um, support network for me, uh, you know, from, from being overseas and been able to ring, ring someone back home and, and have a good chat with them about rugby and how things are going back in New Zealand. And uh, one thing about Razor is he's got a very open mindset. So, look, there's not a lot I can teach him. <laughs> but, uh, look, he, he um, every conversation with him 
as a chance to learn and, and he's you know asking me questions I'm obviously asking him a lot of questions but um, you know he's been great for me and um, you know he's right at the the top end of the international and professional game so it's nice to have that um, as an option. Yeah mate he, he, I listened to a podcast with him and Russell Earnshaw the other week and just the way he articulates everything you know he went to France to look I'm quite unassuming didn't blow his own trumpet I just worked hard I tackled lots. I did all the basics really, really well. Um, and then to have that open-minded. Do you have that in SSFC? So Razor was really open-minded. He listened. You all work with each other. How, how do you as a group and a community of coaches use that to, to get the best out of each other? Yeah, I, I think we do it well. And I'll, I'll be open about that. I think our coaching spine has, has been a huge part in our success. And we're so lucky to have... Um, some amazing coaches lower down who, who just do simply an incredible job and we spend a lot of time with each other off the field you know we socialize a lot with each other and, and our families together and you know and that shows uh, that shows in our coaching structure you know when you've got guys like Chris Mann, um, you know Peter Coke um, you know they're outstanding coaches um, and, and look, we we invest a lot of time in these younger players because uh, they're the future for us of the SSFC and to have that kind of knowledge that kind of expertise and you know, our B team coaches are exceptionally strong. Um, and, you know, it's exciting for us. We've got some, some great guys, some great guys there. I'll never forget, but my time at, at school, not see, was um, I, I was generally excited by John Richardson watching how excited he was to go and coach the fifth team and the sixth team, little side. But then to watch the boys go and to represent the club in the fifth, it meant as much to them as it did in the first team. And it was just incredible. And I was like, wow, there's a whole different side to SSFC that wasn't ignorant to, but it meant so much to them. So it's, it's a phenomenal. I think, yeah, I, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head, Jason. I've often felt that the barometer of the football club is, is how the third team are. And I've said this quite a lot. Uh, the third team have been successful under Noxie for a long time. And Noxie's had a fantastic amount of success for a long time. And it's those um, C2 B2, A2, third and fourth teams who are as important as any team at Sedba. And that's so important that they're coached properly. And we're really lucky to have some really good coaches for those teams. And um, that is so, so important and fundamental to everything that we believe in. Knox, what was incredible? I don't know if it was last season or the season before. Stu, I think he was a forward. Who was the boy that went from the third or fourth team into the first team in his upper sixth year or in the sixth form year? Oh, so we, we've had a few over the years, actually. Um, yeah, so Charlie Graham was a, was a great example. Uh, he, he come on and he, he signed a, a Super League contract at Hull. Um, you know, we've got EJ Freeman this year. Uh, he actually played some games for the 4-15 um, and, and then came through and uh, is doing really well for us. You know, we've got lots of guys. And um, yeah, it's a credit to the coaches, as, as Dan said. You know, Simon Arnold in the 4-15 does a great job. John Lydiard, Rupert Fullett do incredible work with the thirds. And... Um, we're so lucky to have them and look, we, we put pressure on them with their fixtures. Um, we, we give them competitive fixtures and, um, you know, there's some great young boys coming through. And, uh, um, Jason, I'm going to just um, go back in the history books here now. Yep. In, in 1946, Michael Rowe knows his story very well. In 1946, Peter Kinnamouth was an upper six former at Sedba School and he was a cricketer. And he played in the third team. So he finished, he finished his time in the third team at Sedba. He played first team cricket. He went off to Oxford. And two years later, he'd progressed into the Oxford first team. A year later, he progressed into the Scottish first team. And a year later, he was a British Lion. So that's not a bad five years from a, from, from a well, from Sedba third team. Yeah, it's, that's what, it's, honestly, I get phone calls from the Greater Manchester area now of people. Do you know this said Bergen? You know, he played in the third team at SFC. He's unbelievable. He's played in our first team, kicking on, doing so well. But why do you think that is then? So SFC, SSFC have that community of coaches, but is, is it again down to the dog, the passion, the pride, the, the fight of the person? or Because it doesn't happen by chance. I just think they keep on developing when they, when, when they leave. You know, they, they, they've been in this boarding environment for, for, for five years. Um, finally, okay, they didn't make the first and second team. And you're absolutely right. We've had third teamers that have gone on playing in the National League uh, who've played third team here. Burwell, you know, what a man, what a player. He played third team here and he's, he played in Gun Counties last year 
hell, hell of a man. Um, so yeah, I, I just think it's just instilled in them. And we say to them at any level, doesn't matter what they've played in their upper six, go away, go to university, go, go and join a club. Uh, it's just so important they just keep playing. That's the most important thing. And they have, they've, they've, they've developed uh, and they've played at incredible levels. Attached to the club is a really wonderful opportunity to go and tour the world. Uh, and, you know, these children are extremely lucky to have those opportunities. Um, so just reflecting on, on your time, Dan, what was, what was your greatest tour or most memorable tour of, of your time? Uh, I went on a lot, Jason, and, and thoroughly enjoyed all of them. The one, the, the two that spring to mind, 2005, we went out to Australia and New Zealand. We were based on, in well, the Brisbane area and played in A World Schools Championship there. Um, we were fortunate enough to win that and then went on to win the Brisbane Tens. And the whole tour was superb. Not because we were successful, actually, although that helped, but because of the quality of boys and, and mums and dads we had on the tour. It was just a brilliant, a brilliant two and a half weeks. Um, I really enjoyed South America 2008, where we did four or five countries, and especially the Argentina part. And we followed, sorry, we went before England schoolboys. So we played the sides one match or one week before England schoolboys played them. So we were getting absolutely top quality opposition for our first team. Um, and it was a su it's a superb country to tour, Argentina. What was the lessons, Dan? What was the difference in Argentina? What, what was different? Um, well, I, I'm a big believer is when you go on tour, you've got to embrace the whole culture. And we went up to the Iguazu Falls, um, which we, went, we, we got a special plane flight to go and see a waterfall, which you wouldn't have thought 16 to 18 year old boys would enjoy that. But it was absolutely stunning and they loved it. Um, Buenos Aires is an incredible city. Uh, and we spent, also spent some time in Mendoza as well. Um, just the culture, the ethos, everything about the whole country suited a perfect tour for me. At the end, of about eight o'clock, we can talk about the red wine and the meat and the other tour <laughs> as well. Uh, Stu, for you, what, what stood out on your touring with, with the guys? Oh, crikey, I've, I've been all over the world as well. But uh, I suppose in the, the, the early years, my first year, uh, I went to Australia New Zealand as well. So that was 2005, I suppose young member of staff little uh, little responsibility had a great time helped coach the uh, the uh, the assistant coach of the, of the development squad <laughs> um, we had a great time we had a really you know, great set of lads brilliant fixtures uh, went to Australia New Zealand uh, you know really superb uh, I also went you know three years later to, to South America Argentina Euro Uruguay Uruguay wasn't a great place but the fixture was you know incredible played against their their 19s uh, but South Africa for me, I love South Africa. I think I've, I've been there umpteen times, but twice. Uh, we got cancelled this summer, twice with school. Um, it just ticked every box for me. The culture, uh, the hospitality, the rugby, the ethos, everything. I think it's such an amazing place, South Africa. Um, yeah, I know. It's uh, very special. Yeah, Stu, just, just as director of sport and the overarch, you, you're linking with, um, with Dan as headmaster around you know, risk assessments, uh, guidelines of behaviour. I mean, how are the boys on tour? I mean, we've got 17, 18, 16, 17, 18 year old boys. How do we keep them contained? What does that look like? Well, it's funny you should say that because we, we, we take levers, obviously. So we go on tour with the upper six who two, three weeks prior to that have, have left school. They've had the levers ball, they've gone. And we meet schools when we're on tour and they, th they think we're mad. Very few schools will take levers. Uh, and they'll, to the point where, you know, how, how can you control them? How do you stop them from drinking? How do you stop them from going out nightclub? We just haven't had that. We just haven't had that, that, that issue. I think the boys, uh, they have, a, you know, a, uh, they have a lot of respect. Number one, you know, the boys are very respectful. They, they, they value the rugby and they know that, you know, when it's time to let the hair down and relax, we do, we do it properly. They're, you know, I've got no, no problem uh, with, Taking taking levers uh, or, or managing a tour that that's not what causes me the stress. The stress for me uh, when when I've been in charge is you know is everyone safe? Is everyone going to stay fit? Is everyone staying healthy? Worrying about kids running off and going to nightclubs at four o'clock in the morning is not one of my concerns. Yeah. And, and I mean the staff as well. You must keep them in check. <laughs> that's a different. That's a completely different issue. Different question altogether. <laughs> yeah. Nox, how many tours have you done, Nox, so far? Yeah, so I've done two. Um, unfortunately, obviously, the, this summer's one, uh, which 
which looked amazing on paper, so South Africa it got cancelled. Um, but I've been, I've been South Africa and, and New Zealand, so South Africa in 2014, um, and that was a brilliant tour. And um, as Stu mentioned, like you know, it just um, lives and breathes rugby over there and on and off the field. And we had a fantastic time. We we had some great fixtures, you know, Power Boys uh, and Monument games in particular went right down to the wire. And that that's exactly what we want out of a tour. We want those close games. Um, so that was nice. But my my 2017 or our 2017 tour to New Zealand was, was a special one, I guess, for me personally. Um, got, got an opportunity to take, uh, I guess, my team back back to New Zealand, back to Christchurch, where I'm from, and, um, you know, get them to meet my family. And, and we played my old school, St. Bede's, first 15. Um, and that was a really, really special moment for me. And we had a great time on and off the field. Um, and, and it actually, you know, we, we probably didn't quite get the games we wanted um, overall, but we... We built some really good relationships on that tour and we came back in such a good place for that following September, which which I think probably led to ultimately some pretty good success over the next few years. But, you know, for me personally, to be able to introduce the boys to my family um, was, was special, very special for me. So that's a different, two different, completely different cultures, not so. So what was the learning from that? What would the boys have taken away from visiting the director of rugby's hometown? What, what would they be thinking about? Well, I think... Probably a little bit, they probably learnt a little bit more about me than, than maybe they didn't know, you know. Um, I took them to, to my, my home village and um, right, right near the sea and we spent some time there and <clears throat> a beautiful place called Sumner. Um, and just, you know, getting them to meet my extended family and, uh, and friends and it was, a, it was a really nice time. And um, Yeah, look, I, I love that aspect of it and, um, you know, it's certainly something I'd like to do again uh, along the line. But I think... The boys just got immersed with the Kiwi culture and, you know, met some good people and, and talked some good rugby and it was, it was a nice experience. We've got, we're, and we'll jump in and out of the question bar here, actually, because that leads really nicely into one of the questions from Angus is around, you know, how rewarding is it for you guys as coaches um, and members of a community to, to build relationships with the players with, from all teams and beyond Sedva? So even when they've left, they come back for a West weekend, you'll meet them up and down the country at different events. You know, how important is that for you guys? Uh, I mean, for, for me, Jason, it's, it's, so, it's so important. It's hugely rewarding. I'm obviously a, a, a best and privileged to have two, two jobs here at the moment. You know, I'm obviously um, housemaster and, and involved with the rugby. Um, but the relationships you build with the, with the players, uh, and their parents it, it, it is inc it's absolutely incredible you know and and I've been here for 16 years now I've probably been to uh, five old boys weddings you know all of the rugby players it, you know it, 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 it's it, it's superb it's um and it's you know and they're lifelong friends and you know and uh, Dan's older than us and he's now he, he's now the, the guys that he used to teach are now sending their, their pupils here and you know it, 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 because they know and trust you know members of stuff it, 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 it's so rewarding Jason Dan? Yeah, not too much more to add, really. It's, it's a very special part of being a teacher, actually. And one of the most, um, or one of the most special bits of it, the, the rewarding phone call, the 24-year-old the, the who phones you up for advice, who invites you to his wedding, who pops back for a game of golf. Um, it's fantastic. No, it really is. And it, it just shows that when people leave set, but, um, they don't leave our family. And we've absolutely got to keep in touch with them. And, and, it's, and it's great that we do that. And it's also fantastic to, to sit down on a Friday night and turn the TV on and see some of our players on the TV as well. And that's a great thing to do. Um, and you obviously want them to do better than anybody else. And, and you can support them and send them a text to say, well done, well played. Knox, anything to add? Yeah, no, I, I think it's all been touched upon. I mean, there is nothing better, you know, to get a handshake from an old boy uh, on the touchline and who, who's doing well at university or, or, or in the club environments. And I, I guess one thing I will add is, look, you know, the, the, the SSFC badge doesn't come off uh, when they take that shoot off. You know, that, that's with them for life. So, um, you know, we are part of a big family here and we all look after each other and, you know, we do keep in touch, which is nice. No, let's just touch on that because you, you are right and, and we've talk, talked about the length and breadth of the club. Uh, you do a, Is it Player of the Week, SSFC Player of the Week? Do you want to just give the guys a, a bit of an insight for those that don't know about that? Yeah, so that's been, we've been doing this for, for a few years now and, and what it is is um, it, we, we just give it to, 
we give a tie, um, it's an embroidered tie uh, with SSFC Player of the Week and the date of that week on it. And all I do is I ask the coaches throughout the club um, who've been their, their best players um, on a weekly basis. And, and it doesn't have to go to the boy that um, scores the most tries, um, who does all the flashy things. It, it, it can be for someone who's made their first tackle, um, you know, or who just puts in a, a big shift every single week for his teammates. And, you know, I get coaches recommending me players and, and then I, um, I go around and, and personally give the tie to the player who, who um, receives the most votes in, uh, in his boarding house and, and he gets the award in front of his, uh, his peers which is, is quite special, yeah. yeah I'm here. I'm, I'm trying to keep myself organised on the desk. So I've got some notes and questions. Everything's happening in front of me. And I get a text from Woody Barlow. Everybody looks well presented apart from your shirt and tie. If you only knew I ran up in it. Quite right. Quite right. <laughs> After Woody's performance in the Old Boys Tour, I think he'd keep quiet. Otherwise, we could embarrass him a little bit more. Moxie, <laughs> um, there's another question in here probably for, for you, really. It's sort of like, um, you know, it's very easy to motivate the uh, players before a game. In fact, there's probably little motivation because they're, they're ready for, for any challenge in front of them. But what would a pre-match team talk look like? And I'd probably extend that. What does pre, post, um, pre, during and post-match look like in terms of your influence? Um, yeah, look, before kickoff, we've probably done everything we need to do that week. You know, that's by that point, we're just reminding them of, of some key sort of areas in the game that we, we might um, think we can get some some purchase from the opposition or, or certainly some strengths of ours. So um, we're not saying a lot to them before um, they warm up. And then during the game, we're just giving them very um, brief bits of information. You know, we don't want to overload them with too much at half time, but they're only going to remember probably the first thing we say to them um, during that break. So we're very specific, both Stuart and myself, with what we give them. Um, but, um, you know, certainly throughout the week, so the Monday to Friday building up to the game, that's when we would give them more information. That's when we're really getting into it in terms of uh, what we want to achieve. But, you know, when it comes to an hour, half an hour before kickoff, uh, we're going to be confident that we've given them everything they need um, prior to that. Um, but I think, look, you know, our history is a big big push here like the boys are well aware of what's happened in the past what kind of legacy they want to leave so they want to um, put their own stamp on their season um, and you know, they're pretty motivated you know that that brown jersey is special and they want to wear it with pride they want to represent it the way it should be represented now I'm ready to go and chuck my old brown blazer on on my rugby jersey uh, we, should <laughs> this, we should do this once a month and meet up on bus for a game of uh, full contact absolutely so, uh, just talk, we've talked lots about really sort of happy times and great achievements, but you guys being in the hot seat must find some really challenging times as well. So what are the sort of um, challenges that, that you faced in your time, Dan, that, that really tested you and, and sort of made you better for it? Yeah, I think for me it was, it was the first month. So I took over in, in, in 2000 from Neil Rollins, very successful coach who had finished with a really good team that had won Rosalind Park in... 1999 um, and in the first four games we lost three of them which doesn't happen often at Semper uh, and you know the pressure was on really and all sorts of questions were probably quite rightly being asked about the new coach um, but I had a very good headmaster at the time in Chris Hurst who, who, who kept his faith in me and probably deflected quite a bit of the heat uh, and we managed to turn things around. So it was tough early on. Later on in the in the 11 years I did, the hardest bits for me actually were not the Millfield games, the Wellington games, the, the games where perhaps it was 50-50 beforehand and you had to really prepare. It was the banana skins. It was the ones where everybody expected you to win. Um, and it was everyone else's cup final. So you'd be travelling away to somewhere and um, they were the hardest ones I actually found. I, I loved the big games. I loved the Millfields, the Wellingtons, the uh, Landoveries. They were just fantastic. Was there anything in your strategy, Dan, that helped you with that? Is there anything sort of like, we know what who we're facing this week. I know how to sort of stimulate the guys in the build-up to it in the week. Did you change your training at all for, for that week? Or? Well, you'd, you'd, you'd mix things up mid-season um, and you'd have to do. You'd prepare. Uh, I know Knox is a lot of preparation on the opposition. You'd know where their key players are. 
you would focus on positives you would um really work on perhaps what hadn't gone as well the previous week or you'd look at the weather i, I used to look at the weather a lot because i think it really does dictate how you play because it said but we always want to play rugby in the in the right way but you sometimes you've got to slightly adapt and still play rugby and still not kick the ball but actually do it slightly differently to win the game uh, if it's really wet or really windy or poor underfoot it's just preparation yeah i think as well just touching on our relationship from when when i was in your your team you were very coy and strategic with your vocabulary and your conversations with people you know you'd have that time afforded to you as i'm sure Stuart and Oxy do now to to go and have conversations with people about their challenges whether that be individual or collective just to sort of motivate that way were you conscious around that or is that just something that just uh, happened? i think you develop it and and that was 2003 jason when and i'd probably have three years before that where i perhaps didn't do that as well and i think you learn as a coach um you know i watch now i watch the man management styles between noxie and Stu, and they are superb but i think noxie you'd agree you develop that along the way don't you as a coach definitely yeah absolutely and you, and you learn i know you know we will have heard this before but you do learn from your losses and and um no absolutely and and yeah we are you do, yeah. Every day you get better as a coach, but you've, you've got to work hard at it. It's, um, you know, look, if you stand still, you'll, you'll fall behind. So, um, yeah. I, th I think what is interesting to chuck in here is I think that players watch coaches. So if you're a coach that makes mistakes, that blames the ref, that blames the weather, that blames injuries, then your players will. Absolutely. And I think as long as you don't do that and lose gracefully and lose properly, that's a really good start. Um, I'm going to call you guys like the perfect swan on the top. I've been conscious over the last few years, Jason, about, uh, you know, tough challenges. I've been conscious about taking the pressure away from the boys. You know, you look at this year, for example, JJ Quadio, he becomes captain. He's in my house as the head of school. Um, he's, he's captaining a, sorry, he started to captain a team who's not lost for, for two and a half years. That's, that's a, a hell of a lot of pressure. And actually, he shouldn't feel any pressure. They should just go out as normal and, and enjoy. And, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's the coaches that, that, that should take the pressure. But the natural reality is that, you know, nothing's changed. But they, 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 we try and take that pressure away from them and just reassure them that, you know, if, you know, stick to the plan, don't stress about anything and the result will take care of itself. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and going back to JJ, what an amazing, amazing job he's done this year. Yeah, it's that expectation of it built around them and before them that they just don't want to let anybody down. But the way they conduct themselves, they'll never let anybody down because of the immense pride they take in what they do. So you're just talking on you and JJ then, so what does that relationship look like? That's pretty special. You've got the head of school, you've got the captain of First 15 Rugby, and, and you know, you're looking out for, for his best interests, obviously. What's that relationship like? Yeah, well, you know... He he, he's a great guy and first, you know, and, uh, and Dan Harrison gave him that, gave him the head of school because he trusted him. I, you know, I, we put him in that position because we absolutely trust him and, you know, and, and he's been an amazing leader uh, and w the boys put full uh, trust in him and, and that goes on the pitch, off the pitch, training, social situations, in school, you know, he, he's a role model and he bounces ideas. He, he's not, he's not afraid of going to their master's office, bouncing ideas, talking, suggesting things likewise in, the, in, in Knox's office or come and speaks to me. And that, and that's, that, that, that's the qualities of a perfect leader. He's not perfect. Nobody is. Um, but you know, what a fantastic young man he, he, he is. Yeah, it's good. It's, it's great that you can afford that time because you're, you're a busy man, but you afford that time to take, out of your day to, to rest his sort of mind and put him at ease and, and prepare him for the next, next school day. Because even though being part of a rugby club, it's, he's going to school. So you know, you've got to get your books done. You've got to do all the extra other activities that are on offer for you. So, you know, there's a time and place to pick and choose your, your on, rugby moment. On that note, actually, Jason, I think, uh, I think it's very important for, away from the captains now, I think it's very important for the, for the, the, the boys within the first team of the school because everybody looks up on a Saturday, everybody looks at the first team result. Everybody plays their game. The girls, bless them, they play the hockey, they run down, they play the netball, they run down. Everybody supports the first team. And it's, 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 it's fabulous, really. But it's very important that our boys then, on Saturday night, Sunday at chapel, Monday, they speak to the young boys, they speak to the girls, 
asking them how they got on, what was their score, well done, you know, and that makes people feel special. And someone who was amazing at that in my first year was, was David Tate. And I learned a, a, a hell of a lot from him. He was the, the captain in my, in my first year. I wasn't coach. Uh, but what, that, that, was, that was his qualities all over. Um, and, you know, it's so important that these boys have that, have that behaviour and continue that to show empathy with, with other boys and girls. Well, it's interesting, not because you said, um, and it's interesting you mentioned Tate because he was only there for the, for the sixth form and he got it immediately and just escalated rapidly through the ranks. So, and, and he was a, a, a great bloke. But Nox, you, you get the lads now one step further to go down to the prep school, interact, do some coaching sessions with the prep school, right? Yeah, really important to us. And, um, you know, we, we go and train with the prep school. We uh, we try to use their facilities and, and then mix in with them and uh, play some games with them. And, you know, they're, they're the future of the CCFC and, and our boys are role models. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got to interact with these kids. And, you know, just like at the senior school, like we'd expect our first team captain or, or first team players or big side players to, to ask, you know, to see two boys how they went on the weekend. And, and um, is there anything we can do to help you guys? So uh, we, we've got to have that one club mindset. I think it's something that we're really, really good at. And, Look, um, you know, our, our guys are caretakers of that jersey currently and we're just waiting for someone else and, and the club to come through and take it off them. So, um, yeah, the, the future is so important for us. But it was amazing to see some of the pictures on social media. I don't know if it was um, Lucia or the Melvilles, but there was a picture from JJ in, and Carwin in Crestbrook, uh, the prep school, a picture from that time to first 15 time. It was incredible. They hadn't changed. <laughs> Big boys. <laughs> But there's been a lot of rugby between it. Knox, what's been, what's been your tough times? Um, I was very similar to Dan. So, and I agree completely with him in terms of some of those banana skin games. You know, they are very, very difficult. And um, so I do 100% agree with them. I, I had a tough um, 2015, you know, as Stu mentioned earlier on, we, we had a really good run. We probably at that point were playing too many games back to back, Saturday, Wednesdays. And we, um, we lost three in a row and we had a lot of injuries and we, you look, that, that, that's part of the game, isn't it? And we, we had to call on um, some young guys uh, to come and step up and they, they did a really good job to finish out the season. But that was a tough period and I learned a lot about myself and my coaching during that point and, um, you know, and, and I guess came out the other side of that um, in a positive manner, which was, which was nice. Yeah, no, so I love that. And, and I think if there could be a clear message, not just for anybody attached to, to our club, but you know, to the game that remain positive and optimistic because you will come out the other side. Keep your mind open for learning, talk to people. And, you know, it's about growing as an individual, but you can only do that if you, you get together collectively. And that's something you guys do exceptionally well and, and something you should be very proud of. We've got a, a couple of questions now in, um, in the question bar before I sort of throw my last question to you guys. Um, so if there's any more questions that you want to tuck in, Please feel free to do so. Um, a bit of a curveball. Don't know who I'm going to come to here. Knox, I'll, I'll start with the boss of uh, SSFC currently. Do you see ro girls rugby in the future for the club? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, um, look, we've, we've looked at it before and um, we've just got to see what happens, obviously, with, with the coronavirus and what we can and can't do. And look, we're going to... Um, absolutely, you know, do rugby to the best of our ability going forward within those guidelines. And we've got plans in place. So I guess uh, we just have to see what happens and, and whether we've got interest and, and enough interest from, from the girls to do so. Um, and, and obviously, look, whether we've got the coaching structure in place to, to do that as well. But, you know, it's um, certainly I something... I'll it, yeah, I'll chip in a bit there, Knox, as well. I mentioned before that we're a very small school. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're 550 pupils, 500 pupils. Um with lots going on. There's lots on offer and it's very difficult. And, and we are a school that I think if we're going to do something, then we do it right and, and we do it properly and we make sure that everyone has that experience. Um, but what we can, we, we can proudly talk about Abby Scott, Stu. So yeah, Abby, absolutely. Yeah, Abby NOS, England International. What was her time at Sedba like? Yeah, good. And in the latter years, you know, she was at Penrith Rugby Club and, you know, raved about it. And she came down, did a few sessions with the boys. Uh, you know, we obviously facilitated her training and uh, the, the gym program, and she was she was absolutely great, and she was always great for, for, from uh, the, the whole time. Um, what what is a shame actually, because Simon 
we, we had a, a plan in place this summer for a, a mix on a, on a Monday and a, and a Thursday evening to do a mixed up touch, touch rugby tournament uh, on pole in the evenings, which would have been great. We would have mixed up the boys, the girls, you know, and it's a shame that that hasn't happened. So that's certainly, especially in these times, touch rugby could be perfect as an activity. And a casual plug that we did have girls rugby lined up for the summer. <laughs> never, never mind. Next, next year, ne next year on, on that one. Uh, Knox, there's just a really casual question. Why are you called Knox? <laughs> oh, this is, yeah, this, this has been with me for a long time. So it's actually, um, it's pretty, pretty disappointing story, really. Um, but uh, <laughs> oh, look, I look like... Uh, but... Yeah, yeah, probably, probably don't need to go through through with it, really. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really boring. We stay on after eight o'clock, and we can discuss it then, maybe. Absolutely. Um, the last question, sort of, from me to all three of you, Dan, and I'll start with you as headmaster of the school and moving the school forward um, with a very co close affiliation with with the club. Is what does the future look like in in your view for SSFC? Um, I mean, we're obviously in strange times at the moment we'll we'll get back to rugby as soon as we possibly can um i've set a challenge to stuart and to knox to be the best school in the country post covid as we we were pre-covid and and we absolutely will be um and we'll prepare our, our boys and possibly girls in the future in the best possible way um so i think it looks absolutely rosy but you've got to always stick to to fundamentals and to key principles and as long as we stick and keep our feet on the ground, we're not pretentious, we are humble, uh, we are ambitious, but we're kind. And these are really key things that we've got to stick to as a school. And if we do that, we'll be absolutely great. And with these two people and yourself involved in SSFC, we will be fine. Oh, well, yeah, don't include me in the same bracket as these two guys. <laughs> Go away. Um, I'll leave Knox to last you. What, what do you think the future looks like for, for you guys? Take, uh, take, take aside COVID, if, if, if you don't mind. I don't want to get into that, that, that at the moment. You know, we, we launched what we're doing in September. We've got all sorts of exciting plans uh, for September. But let's put that to one side for now. Um, every year since I've been here, since 2004, we've had a successful season. And they've always said, oh, how are we gonna, what are we going to be like next year? Thinking... You know, it can't possibly be as good as last year. Every single year, oh, you know, they're going to be all right next year. And every single year, the boys rise to the challenge. Um, I have absolutely no doubt that our success will continue to grow uh, as long as uh, we stick to, to the fundamentals. And like Dan said, you know, we've got to... Uh, our, our traditions are, are so important. Our behaviour is so important. Our culture is so important. I wrote to all the parents, thank you, and all the boys, thanking them uh, for, for, for a great year. And what I put in there is, you know, the, the boys question why we do things. So we travel to Landovery, which takes six hours on a bus, and we make them wear uniform, full, full shirt, tie, blazers, sitting on the coach. And the only people that see us, because we get there, is people at the service station. And it's not because, uh, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, to be a disciplinarian is to get it is to get the standards right so that simple standards so you're wearing a suit you're behaving little things like that uh, incremental gains to, to to be really successful you turn up to busk uh and you're wearing the wrong kit you go home doesn't matter if you're an england international you're wearing the wrong shorts go back to your house get changed these kind of things there's no start there's no egos there's no nothing okay uh and that's so so important Knox, just before i come to you Stu, uh... You said that you wrote to the players, but you also said, and the parents. Do, the parents play a huge part in, oh. in what you guys do. Do you want to just touch a brief on sort of your parents? And, oh, and I, you know, I'm always, you know, I'm eternally grateful to the parents for their for their support um, on the pitch, off the pitch. You know, the, the feedback they are they're, they're absolutely brilliant, um, and they put huge amounts of faith into into what we do as a school. Um, you know, they are, they're brilliant. And not to mention, they travel all around the country. The first game of the season, we play Whitgift, it's home and away. Uh, when we went away to, to Whitgift, which is, which is Croydon in the middle of London, we had more of our parents on the touchline in the middle of London than they did. That's, you know, that's remarkable. They're, they are, we have some superb parents. So yeah, I'm eternally grateful to them. A lot of conversations I have with people that are considering Sedbur and they're always asked about the children, but I'll always say, but you're included in that community as yeah. well. They, they don't really understand it until they're a part of it, and that's and when you sort of catch up then and reflect on on what's just happened, they're like, 
this is the most incredible experience of, uh, mm. of their lives. And it is, you know, the, my dad still talks about uh, <laughs> school now. He's like, can we go back? No, no, not tonight. Noxie, over to you. Um, so the future of SSFC, how does that look? Yeah, look, I, I think it's exciting. I, I um, you know, there's no doubt we're, we're in difficult times, but we're, we're going to take that on, um, head on, you know. We're, um, we're going to have rugby. Uh, we're going to have a full programme, you know, within the guidelines of what we can and can't do. And uh, we're going to get smiles back on faces, you know, and, and give these guys the experience that they deserve um, within the SSSC. And I, I, look, I'm going to be honest, I can't wait. Um, I can't wait to get back to it and, 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 you know, whether it be participation, whether it be elite, we're going to cover it all. And, um, yeah, can't wait. It's going to be awesome. Oh, yeah, I feel it. And, and, you know, I've been, we all have been so fortunate to, to watch different teams, different wins, different highs and lows. But in the hands, Dan, it was in phenomenal hands with you when you were there. Moving on through the years, it's exciting to have the, the club and the group in such great hands. And, you know, creative hands, caring hands and, Whichever boys fill the jersey at whatever level, that they're going to have the time of their lives. And, and Dan Scargill's just put on a really nice comment there about how MBC gets now, you know, coming and watching the fun that they have on bus, on Riverside, on Newfield and Pole. Um, so all as I can say is thanks very much for giving you time tonight. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody else uh, will give you a, a virtual pat on the back and round of applause at home. So 